Hello and welcome to this Sunday, April 21st, 2024 edition of the EB Market we or Weekly Market Report. Uh, I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and I'll be with you here for the next 25, 30 minutes or so. Uh, going over the action from last week, um, hopefully uh, giving a little bit of perspective on what we saw. It was not a good week at all. Uh, we had some damaging economic reports out. For the most part, earnings were good, but we had those economic reports, which uh, maybe puts the Fed in a little bit of a box right now. And uh, with higher interest rates uh, at hand and possibly lasting longer than many uh, market participants were expecting, uh, I think we're seeing some revaluations in some of the stocks. But first, let's take a look at what happened last week. So I've got uh, the Dow Jones uh, and uh, five other major indices reflected here at the top. And then I have the 11 sectors below. So uh, on uh, Friday of last week, we saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, gain 211 points. But you can see overall, there was mostly selling during the week until we saw that uh, Friday rally. S&P 500, however, down 44 points on Friday, and you can see the selling. Once we went through uh, the moving averages at the beginning of the week, just kept uh, selling off throughout the week. The selling was even more intense on the NASDAQ. NASDAQ dropped 357 points. That was a little bit more than 2%. On Friday alone, uh, for the week, we were down over 5% on the NASDAQ, but you can see a uh, big drop here below the moving averages. And we're also seeing that death cross where we've got the 20-day moving average dropping below that 50. IWM, the Russell 2000, continued to be under pressure. We did see a little bit of a rally at the end of the day on Friday, but overall downtrend as well. Friday's close, though, was up slightly, about two-tenths, close to two-tenths of 1%. Mid-caps, the S&P 400 mid-cap index gaining about four-tenths of 1% on Friday. But again, you can see it came on the heels of some uh, weakness uh, earlier in the week. And then finally, you can see the Dow Transports continuing to sell off and actually cleared a couple of support levels throughout the week. One was at 15,400, where you see a triple bottom. The other was below 15,200. That was a much, much more important level to lose. And we lost that on Friday, did not reclaim it, or we lost it on Thursday, and we did not reclaim it on uh, Friday even though we did get a rebound in transports, we're up almost 1%. So that's going to be a group to see whether or not we have follow through in the week ahead. Moving on to the sectors, uh, the technology area dropping more than 2% on Friday. Discretionary down uh, almost 1% on Friday. Communication services down more than 1% on Friday. These are your three aggressive groups. And I want you to look at their charts. Uh, technology, down below the moving averages, we've seen that death cross. That's one of the reasons or the primary reason why we saw the, the uh, NASDAQ 100 uh, underperform last week. Discretionary stocks also moving straight down. And notice that the close on the XLY was below even the closes that we saw back in January. So we've given back all of the gains from 2024 uh, on the XLY and are now trading at a, or at least closing, at a 2024 low on Friday. Communication services dropping below the 50 day moving averages uh, or average for the first time since uh, back in 2023. This again, not a great sign. And on the heels of what we're seeing with discretionary and technology stocks, these are th three charts that are gonna have to reverse for the market to get its feet back under it. Uh, industrials, these are another two of the uh, um, aggressive groups, industrials and financials. Industrials, uh, maybe not losing as much, but we are still going down. We did break below the 50-day moving average on Friday. And financials, which rebounded on Friday, actually later in the week, Thursday and Friday. But now we've got overhead resistance that we need to negotiate at those key moving averages. So all five of our aggressive um, uh, sectors have challenges of their own um, as we go into a new week ahead. A lot of key earnings reports that will be coming out, earnings season really beginning to accelerate, but uh, overhead technical resistance is going to be a real thing, um, and that's going to be for the first time. I think the market's going to be dealing with it for the first time in 2024, so that is definitely a different uh, maybe look of the market as we head into next week. 
as we move on to the defensive groups, defensive stocks were already not performing well. On a relative basis, they did better last week. But you can see the chart here on the healthcare ETF, the XLV, already saw that death cross. The 20 was below the 50 a couple of weeks ago. And so, yes, we did see relative strength last week, but this is still a broken chart. We move on over here to the staples. Staples did rally back nicely at the end of last week. So that was a at least one area um, where you could make money on the long side. But it too, I mean, is that enough? One day barely closing above the moving averages right there? I'm not sure. Uh, we'll have to follow, see if we can get back through, I would say, maybe around 74, 75. That would be the reaction high that we saw earlier in April. We'd need to get back through there. Real estate, also weak. Uh, did manage to come back up or at least maybe stabilize Thursday and Friday, but it was a rough week uh, at the start of the week and still got a lot of work ahead in that group. Utilities, one of the areas that actually was strong. It was, it was clearly uh, among the strongest areas on the week. You can see Wednesday, Thursday, Friday actually moving to the upside. So we had a lot of money rotating and moving toward more defensive areas, and that was certainly evident in utilities. Energy materials, both moving back. Energy testing its 20-day moving average. Materials testing its 50-day moving average. On a relative basis, these groups have been doing well. But the question going into next week is can we hold key support areas on both of those two sectors? And I don't know. Uh, again, we'll just have to wait and see whether or not that, uh, if, if we do hold those levels. Um, I wanted to show you the various um, indices and major indices and sectors and I did this on a summary. I viewed the list as a summary. So I have all of the major indices and all the 11 sectors that we just talked about in this summary list. And this is a one week look at what was leading last week. You can see it was utilities, consumer staples, two defensive areas of the market, clearly. Um, and then you go down to the bottom and you see technology, you see NASDAQ 100, you see consumer discretionary, the XLY, Clearly, money rotating away from growth, or excuse me, yeah, away from growth and into value. And so there was your uh, move into value. We see that in the form of actual gains last week in a couple of areas. Um, even the financials and healthcare. Financials, I consider part of the more aggressive sectors, but it's the more value-oriented aggressive sector, if you will. Um, normally, what I want to see with financials is just going along with the action to the upside. So if the S&P is going up, it's nice to see financials going for the ride. Don't necessarily want to see financials leading with utilities and consumer staples because that's clearly giving us a flavor of uh, more value or more defensive areas of the market leading. And that's normally not a good thing for stocks. But as you go, back, go down this list, you'll see the Dow Jones actually performing much better than the other major indices. It was flat for the week. Uh, then you move down to the mid-cap index, which was down 2%, uh, a little more than 2%. Transport's down about two and uh, two-thirds percent. Uh, Russell 2000, small cap index, down a little bit more than two and two-thirds percent. S&P dropping a little more than 3%. And then there's that NASDAQ. I think I may have said, uh, yeah, I said earlier that it had dropped more than 5%. There you go. NASDAQ 100 dropping 5.36% last week. So it was clear that as we got further and further into the week, Thursday and Friday really started to turn more negative, in my opinion, because many of the leaders in the market in 2024 started to break down. Stocks like NVIDIA, or how about Super Microcomputer, both getting hit hard and losing major uh, support levels and also key moving averages. So what was the biggest story last week? Well, I think one of the biggest stories is the volatility index. Now, this is a daily chart, and it's showing that we opened over 21. I did not see that. I don't know why the daily chart is showing that, because when I go and I look intraday, um, well, first, let me give you the longer-term view here. A lot of folks you know, think the VIX trends. The VIX doesn't trend. The VIX spikes, and then it settles back down. Then it spikes, and then it settles back down. So you can look across here and see that the VIX 20 years ago was maybe around 15, and right now we're around 18. I mean, it doesn't trend higher over time. It is simply a measure of the um, um, 
of the inherent risk in the market based on the pricing of short-term S&P options. So this goes up and it goes back down. There's no point in putting moving averages on here because moving averages are trend following indicators. Um, in this case, the trend is usually a spike. The market gets panicked. We make a big push to the upside in the VIX and then we settle back down and slowly make our way back down. If you look at all the tops on the VIX, they will all correspond, or correspond to significant bottoms in the stock market. So if you look back, this big, um, well, this was maybe just slightly off. We did see a little bit of uh, pullback. But if you go back and you look at every one of these spikes, for the most part, they're going to line up with the lows that we saw in the market at that period of time. I mean, here's 2015, big drop. Here's this, another spike. This is 2016. Had a little bit of a pullback here in the second quarter of 2016, we get a spike. Another little pullback in the fourth quarter of 2016, we get a spike. These are all going back up through 20. Uh, what about the beginning of January or beginning of uh, 2018, January, maybe through uh, March, first quarter? Market pulls back, big spike in the VIX. The uh, trade war related cyclical bear market at the end of 2018, pulling back, VIX spikes. How about the pandemic? That VIX went crazy, went up to 90. Um, and, it, and then throughout the cyclical bear market, you can see the spikes that we saw. Well, what we saw last week with the market pulling back was that VIX starting to move back up again. And in my studies, if you go back since we broke out on the S&P 500 above the 2007 and 2000 high, that occurred in uh, April of 2013. So in my view, that's when the secular bull market began. We've been in it ever since, even though we've had some significant uh, bear markets to deal with, cyclical bear markets um, and corrections. But since 2013, since making this move to the upside, I did a calculation of how the S&P 500 trades when the VIX is at certain levels. And when the VIX closes above 20, that's when we have the biggest moves to the downside in the S&P 500. So watching this and making sure we don't have that close above 20 is one thing that I certainly am watching myself. I think it would be worthwhile to keep an eye on because when the VIX gets above 20, it, it's an indication that the market is um, getting more panicked. And a lot of times you will see a much bigger drop and perhaps capitulation um, that occurs with fear and a much steeper drop and then recovery. So if you're looking for what could be triggering a bottom, uh, I would say a, uh, a really big spike in this VIX where we see it reverse and come back down. That'll be a, a sign that perhaps the VIX has, uh, has found a top and as a result, market has found a bottom. I'm not sure if we're there just yet. Um, in fact, we were still going up and closed fairly close to the highs that we've seen of late on the VIX. And so a little bit more movement, the upside in the VIX, and you can really, we started to see a little bit more of that selling, the intensity of the selling late Thursday and Friday. And I think that could even accelerate further if we see that VIX break out above 20. So you do want to be careful as a short-term trader. Again, long-term trader, I've said it for the last 11 years, going into our 12th year, I'll say it again. I, in my opinion, we're in a secular bull market, hasn't changed didn't change when we had the cyclical bear market of 2022. It didn't change when we had the pandemic. It didn't change when we had the fourth quarter trade war issues back in 2018. We bounced out of them, set all-time highs. I don't know where the selling is going to go. Um, it was just a month ago I was talking about, hey, I thought we could maybe pull back 4 or 5%. We pulled back a little bit more than that on a couple of the indices, especially on the NASDAQ. And uh, right now we've pulled back just about five, maybe between five and 6% on the S&P 500. And we got some big earnings reports coming in. So I'm not sure exactly where we're going to finish here, but or, or when this selling is going to be over. But I do believe once it ends, we're going to turn around at later this year and go back to all-time highs. That's what I believe. So it's going to be a day-to-day -day thing, maybe week to week as we watch this play out. I can tell you that last summer, Right about the top, I got I grew cautious and I said maybe we'd see you know a few percent to the downside and it morphed into a correction. We went down ten percent. I thought we'd go down maybe four or five percent. 
maybe we'll go down 10%. It's really hard to try to predict in one of these, you know, when you're not getting all, all my signals haven't turned bearish, but some have, uh, and I'll show you some of them as we go throughout the show. But, you know, this could morph into 10%. Um, do I think it's going to go down 20% for a cyclical bear market? No, I don't. Um, is it possible? Sure, anything's possible. Um, but right now what I would be doing is watching some of the key ratios uh, that I, I like to follow. Um, look at the intermarket or intraday action um, to see whether or not a lot of this is just gaps. Thursday and Friday, we saw a lot of selling. I'll certainly admit that. A lot of big red candles. I mean, you look at NVIDIA chart, SMCI, many of the uh, semiconductor stocks uh, did have rough, rough uh, weeks last week, especially toward the end of the week. So does that continue or do we see more selling and then afternoon buying? Um, that's going to tell us, that's going to give us some pretty good clues as well. Um, so watching the VIX, I think this was an important chart last week. And I think it's probably going to be one of the more important ones to continue to watch this week. Another thing that I, that I saw that was very interesting on Wednesday of last week, you see this spike on the equity only put call ratio. I think I had somebody write in to me at uh, Earnings Beats asking about it. So I wanted to post this because I took a picture, a screenshot of what happened over at the um, CBOE. What you have to worry about with, um, or maybe even to set bottoms, is when we get massive spikes in this equity only put call ratio. The problem here is that I don't think this had anything to do with the retail traders. And I'll show you what I mean. Hold on one second. I'm going to switch out the charts. I want to show you this screenshot that I took. So here's a screenshot. This was Wednesday of last week. Um, and it gives you half hour readings over at the CBOE.com. And if you look at the put call ratio, I mean, it was started off two thirds, you know, 0.68, then it rose throughout the day. But look at these spikes that came in late in the day. Now, the number at, at uh, stock charts doesn't correspond exactly, um, but it does tend to, you know, when it spikes over at the CBOE, we see it spike at stock charts. Anyhow, it was going up throughout the day, but look at the moves that were made in the last 30 minutes, really from three, this is a, a central time. So we're talking about 2.30 central, which is 3.30 Eastern. From 3.30 to just after the close, you can see the total number of contracts jumped 1.3 million, which was almost one half of what had been, uh, you know, what had changed hands all day long until 3.30. So all of a sudden there was this huge spike in equity um, only options, both calls and puts. But if you dig a little deeper, look at what, what happened in, uh, after 3.30 Eastern on the puts. We went up from 1,386,000 to 2,551,000. That's 1,165,000 equity, equity puts. And the calls went up by 150,000. Now, that is about eight times as many equity puts as equity calls. And I can tell that's, that's like an eight to one equity only uh, put call reading in the last 30 to 45 minutes. That's, has, that's I, there's never been a retail trading, uh, uh, a retail number that's been anywhere close to that. I remember back during the financial crisis, uh, 2008, 2009, probably the biggest um, half hourly readings, these are cumulative readings. So to get the half hour reading, you have to take the totals at one half hour, and subtract the totals from the net, from the previous half hour. And that'll give you what was traded that particular half hour. I never saw that I can recall the equity only put call ratio get above maybe three, three and a half to one in a half hour reading. Eight to one is outrageous. And so what I believe uh, that that represented, and I'll go back to... Um, to the chart. Let me get that other chart back up for you now. So what I think happened here, same thing that was happening on many Wednesdays back in, you know, this was during the uh, the correction last summer, and then even in toward the end of the year, 
I believe that you had large, uh, large portfolios, uh, por portfolio managers. Um, I think they were hedging against some of the biggest um, tech names. The, you know, that's what there were articles that came out. I want to say it was toward the end of 2022, um, but also in 2023. There were a lot of hedge funds and so forth that were coming out and buying a lot of those large cap names, a lot of the equity puts as insurance on many of these names. I guess if they hold big positions, they want to you know, sell puts to make sure that they can, uh, or buy puts, I should say, so that they can make sure they have some protection or a lot of protection to the downside. The hedging is not the same as retail traders being panicked. Um, and so when I look at the CPCE reading, I'm using it to try to gauge what's going on at the retail trader level. And that's why I created my own user-defined index, where when I get these crazy readings intraday, I strip out what I believe is, you know, close to or an estimate of the amount of hedging that's taking place by hedge fund managers, portfolio managers, and the like. Because I want to have a reading that's more based just on the retail trader. Anyhow, if you strip that out, you can see that the, the readings, this reading probably would have come in more like 0.75. And the other readings during the week were all below point, you know, seven, uh, 0.75 and below. So I don't think we've reached any kind of an extreme pessimism uh, in the options world just yet, which means we could still have more downside before this triggers. I would, you know, I mean, even Friday, we closed at 0.65. That's like the average reading since, you know, over the last 15, 20 years. That's not a scary, panicked type of reading on Friday that we saw. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out because I think, you know, when you're looking at sentiment, I'm looking, you know, if I'm looking for capitulation, one of the best indicators is the five-day moving average of this CPCE. And it's not going to work when you have these readings. You have to adjust these out. Anyhow, I'll be talking about that more this week uh, to Earnings Beats members. I just wanted to point it out that you do need to strip that out. A lot of people look at that and say, oh, wow, there's a lot of panic. Hedging is not panic. There's a difference. So just make sure you understand that spike was not as bad as it looks um, in terms of the fear. So I still think we've got potentially more fear. If that VIX shoots through 20, and then we see this five-day moving average of the CPCE start moving up toward 0 0.80, then we might have reason to be looking for a bottom. Until then, I think we got to be careful because there could still be some additional selling ahead. We may morph into a 10% correction. A lot of times when that VIX gets above 20, I call it a market that is um, not insane, but it's it kind of loses its ra it loses its rationale or rationality and uh, becomes irrational. And so all you just, you see is just a lot of selling from panic, um, and that is not really. I mean, I'm, it's not that I'm not worried about it. I want to make sure that I'm not in it uh, because the market tends to drop pretty quickly uh, when that occurs. But anyway, uh, I could talk about that for a while. If you're an Earnings Beats member, be looking for that in the daily market report this week. I'll, I'll certainly be talking about that much, much more. All right, Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, I just wanted to show you the chart here. I know a lot of folks are real nervous about the market, but if you look at the weekly chart, we have the Dow Jones sitting on its 20-week moving average. Many times that's just a test. Uh, during a secular bull market, we come down and we hit that 20-week moving average, you go right back up. So... I'm not, I'm kind of on the fence here. I'm seeing some signs saying, hey, be careful. I'm seeing other signs that say this could be the bottom. So we need to look and watch the action at the beginning of this week to get a little bit more feel for which of those two it is. I mean, if we see that VIX spike through 20 and a big sell-off, then there's a chance we're going to see some more selling in the near term and it could accelerate. The S&P 500 on a weekly chart, closing just above its 20 week moving average. The downside or the, you know, the flip side of this is the NASDAQ 100, which finished below its 20 week moving average. This one I'm gonna be watching very closely in the upcoming week to see whether or not that breakdown leads to more selling and more volatility. Um, something to keep an eye on for sure. Now, I've got a lot of 
signs saying that, hey, growth underperformed last week. And, you know, you got to be careful because money's rotating out of growth um, and into value. Seasonality says starting May 1st, we're actually moving into by far the best period of the year for growth stocks. Next four months, May through August. This is the IWF, which is large cap growth ETF versus the IWD, which is large cap um, value ETF. And so this relative strength, and I go back 12 years, so I'm going back to the start of the secular bull market. And you can see if you add up the um, average outperformance by month over the next four months, this totals 5.3%. So there's an average of growth outperforming value by 5.3% uh, over these next four months. And this is over since the last uh, 12 years, back to 2013. If you add up all the other months, I mean, basically this is, uh, I can add it up real quick. That would be uh, minus one, seven, one, six, six, two, plus four, plus two. It looks like um, the rest of the year, the other eight months, if you add up the total, it's plus 0 0.2. So growth outperforms during these next four months by 5.3%. And in the next eight months, it outperforms by 0.2%. All of the strength over the last 12 years has been bottled up from May to August. Maybe this year's different. Maybe we're going to sell off, have a big sell-off, but you need to be aware because if we go, let's say we sell off this week and we get closer and closer to May and then we see some sort of a capitulatory sell-off where we reverse, put in a hammer, watch what happens to this group because we could start seeing money rotate pretty rapidly given the history of growth versus value. All right, a couple of ratios that I like to follow and you can see S&P 500 moving down, and you can see QQQ versus a spider moving down, setting new lows. XLY, XLP moving down, setting new lows. When I say setting new lows, these are lows in 2024. We haven't yet broken down to a new low on the S&P 500. So we're seeing that rotation that we saw in March, February and March, which is normal. It's carried over into April. Some of this is normal, but it's starting to accelerate. Um, and it certainly bothers me because these ratios, I think, are really important for me in calling the market. Um, but all of them, as I go down, here's the IWF, IWD, breaking down to a multi-month low. Um, then we got large cap uh, index versus um, large cap growth index versus large cap value, breaking down to a probably about a three, three and a half month uh, low. Uh, Mid-cap growth versus mid-cap value, completely falling apart here over the past two months. And then, um, or that was small cap. I'm sorry, this is mid-cap up here. Small cap. And then here's transports versus utilities, also breaking down. Now, what happened in the correction from last year? You see how we kept going lower and lower on the S&P? Well, the low on the QQQ versus the spider actually occurred in August at this low. As we kept going lower and lower, money was rotating back into growth. Similar thing was happening with the XLY, XLP, although we did have one more move lower with that final October low, but this was also starting to move up until then. How about IWF, IWD? Same thing, rallying higher. Uh, large cap growth versus large cap uh, value moving higher. Uh, mid cap growth versus mid cap value putting in higher lows. Small caps, not the same. Small caps did go down, uh, kind of like the XLY. And uh, that move in October, we did see a lower low. And same for the utilities. But we had a few of these key indices that actually bottomed on the first low. And that was a, a signal to me that this was not lasting. There's no reason when prices are moving down, you start talking about maybe ec uh, economic recession, something like that. Money is not rotating back into growth in that kind of an environment. And sure enough, that's where we saw the big rally went back to all-time highs. So a lot of times it's not what the S&P is doing. It's what we're seeing in other areas. And right now, many of these growth versus value ratios that I'm showing you are still pointing down, which tells me that this might not be over just yet.
All right. Um, over the last week, I pulled up all of the industry groups um, and to see which ones performed worst relative to the S&P 500. And as we look at the worst autos, semiconductors, you will see some of these XLRE industry groups. These are all real estate. You can see the uh, sector first. And then I have the industry group after that. Um, but you can see autos, semiconductors in the industrial space, trucking. You know, when I see trucking go down and I see railroads going down, um, transports breaking down, that's a sign that the market's a little nervous about the economy. You know, right now we got the GDP, you know, which last quarter was what, three, three point or last uh, fourth quarter was 3.4, I think was the final. GDP is going to be out this week. And it's looking for, right now, the estimate I saw by the Federal Reserve was like 2.9%. So we're still expecting growth, but slowing growth. You know, this is, I think, what kind of puts the Fed in a box because they don't want to unnecessarily keep rates higher. In other words, if inflation is coming under control, they want to lower these rates. This is what, you know, talking about a soft landing, they want to be able to start to lower the rates to help with the economy at just the time when maybe the economy is starting to slow. And with some of the reports last week, I mean, we had, we've got a lot of mixed reports. I know last week we had a hot retail sales report that goes, tends to go up and down, but it was a hot report uh, to start the week. We also had um, housing starts and building permits, which were horrible, horrible, like huge misses. And so that's a sign that maybe that housing market not only has cooled down, but is really starting to reverse. Well, higher interest rates for longer could mean higher mortgages. And that's not exactly what you want in the home building area when we're getting lower housing starts and building permits and so forth. So, you know, the Fed would really like to lower for certain reasons but they kind of feel like their hands are tied with the inflation. And that's the battle that they have and the challenge that they have on their hands right now. And that's why we do have to be careful. I mean, even if, you know, my signals, which I think have been extremely, um, you know, strong, they've, they've helped guide us for the last five years. And I think probably better than any guidance that I've seen anywhere else. But, you know, no, nothing is right every time. And when I start seeing some signs that are saying, hey, be careful with the economy here, you know, we, we could be teetering a little bit. I mean, jobless claims still good. Retail sales were good. Um, you know, some of the pressures on wages have started to, to wind down a little bit. But then we've got housing starts that are really uh, falling off a uh, cliff. You know, we got mixed signals and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the Fed navigates all of this. Anyway, these were the areas that did not perform well. Computer hardware, horrible. Gambling stocks, specialty retail, um, home builders, software, travel and tourism, broadline retail, recreational products. These are all areas that should do well when the economy is strengthening or expected to strengthen. And yet we saw them really take it on the chin last week. What led last week? Well, look over here. Okay, we had an industrial group. We had airlines, which was one area of transports that did do well. Um, UAL, by the way, had a, had a nice uh, report and ended up really strong last week. But if you look, you got healthcare, you've got staples, utilities, staples, 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 financials, utilities, real estate, financials, financials, utilities, staples, financials. That's all value oriented. It's all defensive or value oriented areas of the market. So it's telling you the market is being careful right now. And that's normally what happens when the market goes down. We see those groups tend to outperform. They hadn't been outperforming, though, earlier when the market was kind of teetering. But last week, clearly, they outperformed. So are things changing? I don't know. Again, we're going to want to kind of follow that again this week, along with the VIX and along with some of these other um, intermarket relationships that I talked about. Here's home builders. Look at the home builders coming down, breaking below the moving averages. Since the beginning of April, we were up near 2750 and now we closed at 2400. That's 350 points, which is probably close to 12, 
of this index lost in three weeks. This has been a pretty significant drop. Now you've got some support levels to watch and maybe we're going to come down. Like I said, we could get a capitulatory move where maybe we've got breakdowns on these indices intra-week or intraday, and then we come rallying back. That could be the sign of a reversal, could be a sign of money rotating back into growth, but we need to see it first. I'm not going to sit back and just hope that it happens and, and start throwing a lot of money at the market. I think we've got to see it. Uh, I mentioned railroads earlier. Look at railroads. I mean, we're back maybe off of this uptrend. This could be a head and shoulder pattern. If we get a bounce back to the 20 day, that would be a very symmetrical looking head and shoulder, left shoulder, neckline, head, neckline, a bounce maybe back to the 20 day. So this is a pattern maybe to keep an eye on. Now, last week uh, on Friday, I mentioned one of the financials in our EB Digest. And I said, this is probably, uh, or this is, uh, is the best looking stock in the financial space. I don't remember exactly what I said, but AXP relative to its consumer finance peers had just been going up, 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 which tells me that Wall Street's accumulating. Uh, we also saw that AD line, even though we had pulled back toward uh, the late March, early April period, we pulled back in price. AD line was still threatening to go out, you know, up and break out. And then the report came out. And what I said last week was, I was expecting very, very, very strong results from AXP. We got those strong results, massive volume and a breakout. Um, so on Monday uh, this week, I'm going to be giving another chart that uh, will be reporting, company that will be reporting next week, that I'm looking to have similar results, a blowout report. Um, and if you want to uh, see that, you can go over to earningsbeats.com. If you scroll down, if you're not already an EB Digest subscriber, do it now. Name, email address, hit that subscribe button, and uh, we will send that report out to you tomorrow. Um, but just go over to Earnings Beats, earningsbeats.com, and scroll down. If you want to become a member um, at Earnings Beats, we have a lot of perks for our members, but just start your no-cost 30-day trial there. One thing that we do for members is when you sign in at your account um, into the member portal, if you click over here under chart list, stocks and chart lists, if you scroll all the way down, you will see this upcoming earnings chart list. And so what we can do or uh, as a member, it's free. You know, you could be in 30 day free trial. You come over here and you copy that password right there. Click on this. Then you paste the password, unlock the list, and you could save it then to a chart list if you're a um, member over at Stock Charts, uh, Extra or Pro, you can save your chart list in here. You can replace a list. You can just put a list in there. And I mean, I'm just going to call it uh, Test One uh, here and save results. And it'll take almost no time. But what this does, this is just one of our upcoming chart lists. There were others on the site right here. You can see all the all the various chart lists. You can download those. And what it does is this is a um, this was the chart list for any companies reporting Thursday after the close to Friday morning before the open. And so now I can view the chart list because I just downloaded in my account and I can pull this up in summary form. And this is a one day reading of what how they did on Friday, but they're going to report this Thursday uh, after the bell or Friday before the open. So the beauty of having this chart list, though, is on Friday morning at 931, you can go in and pull this chart list up in summary form like this, and you can literally sort it by the companies that are performing the best after earnings versus the ones that are performing the worst after earnings. So you can take a look. This In this case, if I go to the edit, I've got 191 stocks that are reporting earnings and I can look at them in one click of the you know click of the mouse uh, with this summary chart list form otherwise if I wanted to look at all of them I'd have to go through and look at 191 individual charts so we simplify this for our members and every you know throughout earnings season while earnings are really pouring in we do this in advance for all of our members 
so that you can download this into your account. So start your 30 day trial and uh, certainly uh, take a look at this. Um, that is about what I wanted to go over today. So I really appreciate you all tuning in. It's going to be an interesting week um, ahead, no doubt about it. But um, we'll continue to keep you posted. Um, for Earnings Beats members, I can tell you, though, I will be heading out of town on Wednesday. So I'll be reminding you as we get closer and closer. Um, so a lot of our normal services for the upcoming week, starting Wednesday afternoon through the weekend, I will be out of town. Um, so vacation of sorts. Um, I'll do what I can, but there's probably not going to be a whole lot of services, especially things that I would normally do Wednesday through Saturday. Um, John Hopkins will be providing daily market report, though, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just a brief update, keep, keeping everyone posted. I will be watching the market from afar. Um, and if I see anything that I think is really noteworthy, I'll pass it along to John so that he can share that with you Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But anyway, I just want to make sure everyone is aware uh, that I do have uh, a trip planned this week. So I'll be taking some vacation, but it could be in the middle of a really crazy week. And I'll try to, uh, again, keep John you know, posted as well um, as to what I'm seeing in the market. Anyway, have a great week ahead, everybody. And happy trading.